if this is the one and only true way to achieve eternal salvation. And these people that this God has made who will never be able to understand the gospel message well enough to accept it for themselves, they all get to die. Not only do they get to die, but they get to be tortured for all eternity because their God made them a certain way. These are all things that your God uses to keep you in line and to keep you believing that you are being loved and cared for when in reality you are only being controlled. This skewed notion of what love is, is permeating more families, more relationships, more churches, more people, and their perceptions of the world and their perceptions of themselves every single minute of every single day. Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists, and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective. And a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And it's time to get unbound. You know what, Shell? What? I want to know what love is. But I don't want Yahweh to show me. <laughs> I personally think he's a really, really bad example, and that is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Hey, I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And I'm excited about this episode. It centers on a topic that I have touched on a lot in previous episodes, and we're just going to really take a look at a few examples of what love is and what love isn't, and how the evangelical mindset really gets a lot of this bass backwards. Um, and it really does. There are so many misconceptions so many misinterpretations of what love is in evangelical Christianity. We could probably do a four-parter on this and not scratch the surface, but I want to save some content for later episodes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I sat down and started making a list of ways that God shows how much he doesn't love us throughout the Old Testament, mm -hmm. how little he cares about people. And the way that um, evangelicals will flip the tables on this right. and try and make it look like all of these horrible things that this deity does are somehow rooted and based in love. Well, we're going to take a look at a lot of that stuff later tonight, but we are going to resurrect our Christians Behaving Badly segment because I know Shell wanted to um, wanted to talk about something in particular that yes. uh, that she saw online this week. Yes. It's more like... They're not really behaving badly. I just think it's Christians doing weird shit that doesn't do any good. No, that's that's indoctrination <laughs> for you. So what did they do in this instance? Well, um, this is from the Bethel Church in Redding, California. You may remember them as the people who said that their seminary students are said to attend Christian Hogwarts. And they tried to resurrect the dead toddler. Oh, that, that was the place. Okay. Yes. Well, they were having a service that had to do with racism and how they wanted to defeat racism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's a good effort on its face. It, it seems like it would be something good to concentrate on, something good to have a sermon about. But what they did was kind of odd. They had a prophetess who was talking about how she had watched the Lord of the Rings. Here we go. And she really liked that scene with Gandalf and the Balrog. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, was, I almost gave away the line, but the line is important. So go yes. ahead. And she said that with all of his authority, he said, you shall not pass. And he and the monster could not pass. And she was just, she was just really, really excited about it and thought that it was a great tool for casting out the spirit of racism. Okay, so we're going to use a scene from a movie, mm -hmm. from a fictional movie, a fictional story with fictional magical people Yes. to do something in the material world. Of course. Okay. But evangelical Christianity has nothing to do with Eastern mysticism or witchcraft, or, or any of these sympathetic things. magic. No, no, nothing like at all. That. Continue. Well, this this lady, she brought out a big wooden staff, and they had several people on stage. It was a very multicultural group. 
I believe the prophetess was black. So everybody put their hands around that staff and everybody started chanting in unison, you shall not pass. Just over and, and over and over again. Banging the staff on the How long stage. did this go on for, at I, least as far as the video goes? I, oh, it, it, the video is only a clip and it was only like okay. a minute. And I was like, oh, this is enough. I can't take more than a minute of this. But I was thinking about it because, I mean, it's a good tool. It's a good, it would be good if you wanted to teach people how to think about defeating racism or something like that. But the problem is that they're viewing racism as a spiritual being, not a system of oppression that has been working since the foundation of our country. Not necessarily a spiritual being. It doesn't sound like a yes. being. It's more of a spiritual concept yes. that they're trying to they're trying to, that they're trying to, to bar the gate to, basically. Yes. They're trying to banish the spirit of racism. And it's like racism is not a spirit. It is a series of systems and acts that have been perpetuated in our country since before the founding of our country. Oh, absolutely. And you can't cast out systemic racism. So in reality, this service could have done a lot more, but in the end, everybody goes home feeling like, I guess it's all done now. Yeah. I guess racism is solved. Because it's so much easier to cast a spell on something. And I'm sorry, but that's what they were doing. Yes, they were casting it's a no, spell. It's so much easier to cast a spell on it than to deal with it. Right. It's like, okay, now in their minds, they've done something and they've done something demonstrative. They've done something with the purpose of other people seeing it done. Right. So that in some way exonerates them. Right. Now, I've said this many, many times before. One of the arguments about racism that I'm seeing a lot on social media now that really gets under my skin is people coming on and saying, well, you know what? My ancestors weren't even in this country during slavery they were off doing this that and the other so why do i owe these people an apology and i'm going to tell my listeners the same thing that i tell everybody else it's not the individual that needs to apologize for racism it's the system mm -hmm. that needs to apologize for it by allowing change right in the way that we do things in the way that we teach certain things i'm all with jane elliott on this one when she says that if you are white in America and graduate high school and are not a racist, then your social studies teachers didn't do their job. Right. And it's, it's true. Um, unfortunately, it's just, it's just the truth of where we are as a culture. I will readily admit that I am white and more racist than I want to think about because these things still, they go through my mind. I hear things that come out of my mouth that, Five seconds after I say them, it's like, wait, hold on a sec. That really didn't sound like you wanted it to sound. That really didn't convey what you're thinking here. But because my brain has been taught to think in certain ways and in certain directions, even if my intentions are good, some of those tendencies can come right through right. with what I'm saying. Right. And it's kind of scary it how is. that works. It's it very is. scary how, how involuntary it is. But the involuntary nature of it also, I think, gives a lot of people license to say, well, this really isn't my problem. But it well, is. It is. And I come back at that argument with people and I tell them, look, my ancestors were doing things like making shoes in southern Italy. All right. So, no, they weren't involved in slavery either. But I am involved in a culture right. that has taught me from the time that I could understand that I am in some way superior to right. other people out there because of my race, because of what I look like, and really very, very little more. Right. And that's problematic. If you don't believe that uh, white privilege is a thing, you just aren't paying attention. Right. It absolutely, positively is a thing. And as white people, we are basically forced to take part in it. Okay. Yes. We're forced to be part of this machine. And that's why it's time to start throwing some wrenches into the cogs. Right. And of start forcing change where change is necessary because I do not like the idea of systemic racism, but I live in a culture where it has permeated so much mm -hmm. that I can't get away from it. And those thoughts still get tossed into my head. Yeah. Even now these thoughts 
make their way in. And sometimes they come out in words that I'll have to step back and say, wait a second, no, backspace, don't say that, don't don't post that or whatever. And hopefully it's not something that I've said out loud. Yeah. But I mean, my brain can catch a lot of it these days. Mm-hmm. It can it can latch on to, okay, that's not precisely what you mean to say here. But because of a lot of different circumstances, it's hard to articulate what those real feelings and thoughts are. Do I believe that all lives matter? Yes, I totally believe that all lives matter, but I have no issues with the Black Lives Matter movement or using that hashtag because if you want to use a biblical example, and I just saw this a couple days ago and I liked it a lot. If you want to use a biblical example of why we should be saying Black Lives Matter and not worrying so much about the all lives matter aspect to it. Anyone ever read the parable of the lost sheep Mm -hmm. where Jesus left the 99 to save the one? Well, guess what? The 99 weren't insignificant. The 99 mattered too, but it was the one that was in trouble at that point. Right. So Jesus left the 99 to try to save the one. Can we leave the all lives matter aspect of this off to the side where those 99 are safe and deal with the issue of black people being exploited, abused, and killed, especially at the hands of police. Right. Especially at the hands of a penal system that has been privatized and has systemically created the new slavery in this country. Of course, yes. These are all problems. The same things that were problematic during slavery are problematic now. It's just that they're wearing different faces. Yes. And because they're out of public view, because now they're behind all that barbed wire and behind all those bars, all of a sudden there's something that's okay about making people work hours and hours on end for little or no pay. Right. And I'm sorry, but that is what slavery is. Right. So we still, we still, in the year 2020, participate in these things. It's just that they've grown more subtle and they're not as much in the public eye, but they are still there. And that is why I have no qualms or issues using a hashtag like Black Lives Matter or using the hashtag Black Lives Matter, because guess what? Those are the ones that are in danger right now. The all lives aspect of it, you know what? Go live safe in your white little world and pretend that this isn't a problem if that's what you want. But those of us who understand a thing or two about a thing or two also understand that this is not a racist thing to say that black lives matter. It needs to be said. Mm -hmm. Another example that I can remember from way back, we're talking more than 40 years now, and we haven't learned anything. Remember that episode of uh, All in the Family when they all had their own perspectives on the black guy who was in the house to help uh, fix the refrigerator. Yep. The only one that made any rational sense was Edith's. Right. And the way that she remembered the conversation between this repair guy and her husband, it went something like this. Um, Archie called him boy at some point, and he just stopped the conversation and said, hey, you know what? I don't like that. And Archie said, you don't like what? I'm not a boy. I'm a man. He said, okay, well, you know, I'm a man too. I don't go around making a point of it. And the repair guy looks at him and says, the black repair guy looks at him and says, you've never had to make a point of it. There you go. Do you understand now? We've never had to make a point that our lives matter as Caucasians in this country. We've never had to make a point of it because it's been handed to us on a silver platter. That is why black lives matter is relevant. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's why I stand behind the movement. And that is why I have no problem using the hashtag. And yes, all lives matter. Theirs don't matter more than yours, but they are the one sheep that is in danger. And if you are an evangelical Christian, start thinking about this the way that your so-called savior did. Yeah. Unfortunately, this type of fictionalized, I'm trying to figure out what I want to, how I want to put this. Christians use fiction as truth. I mean, there's the Bible. I mean, you can call that fiction. Well, I will call it fiction because it is a work of fiction. Right. But they do it with other things. Of course, Not because just... this is this is what they this is how they've been taught to think. Right. It says this in a book, so I'm going to believe it. Well, they found something else 
that they liked in another book. So now they're going to believe that too. Right. But, you know, they used Lord of the Rings in this example. But when I was in college, they were using Frank Peretti books. This Present Darkness and I think Piercing the Darkness was the sequel. I know that you hated them. You, like, didn't even get through the first one. I got through... 60 pages of the first one and the writing was so atrocious I just couldn't handle it I anymore. had a little less discerning tastes in literature mm-hmm. so I read both of those books voraciously but people were using the term prayer warrior this is when it really started coming about when people started using the term prayer warrior praying a canopy of protection around you those type of terms were directly cribbed from those books. I mean, and that is, like, really fiction. This was, you know the author of this. It didn't actually happen. It was written by a guy. Right. But everything that they believe is so far-fetched. I mean, just go right back to the Garden of Eden. And a lot of the things that show up in the Bible have a lot of the same elements as high fantasy anyway. Right. So this is the type of thing that appeals to me. I can remember back in the 70s and early 80s, there were a lot of Christians that loved Star Wars, thought that the Force and the way that the Force was um, was presented in these movies had a lot of relevance in Christianity also. The whole aspect of Obi-Wan saying, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And they equated that to the atoning work of Christ on the cross. There was a lot of that, too. As as many Christians as were against those movies because of the Eastern mysticism aspect of it, there were plenty that saw especially Obi-Wan as a messianic figure and thought that that movie was conveying a Christian-like message. Yes. So it's just, it's what they're used to. They have been taught to think of mysticism as normal. So it doesn't surprise me in the least that they would take a book like Lord of the Rings and or, or a movie in this instance and just pull from it whatever they want to pull from it and call it truth. Right. Because that's what they've been taught to do with the Bible right. also. So it, it just sort of, you know, it gives them things to work with that aren't sensible in any way, shape or form. I mean, we all make up stuff in our head to explain the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially when we don't accept science. Right. When you're like, okay, well, I have to discount this because this is all sciencey stuff. And I don't believe in all the sciencey stuff. So the only alternative is to create magic inside your head to explain this. Right. And that's what they do. It's what they taught us to do in Wicca. It's just they were a lot more outward about it. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. like you are literally causing this to happen, but you're not noticing that it's happening because you're pretending to magic it. Right, right. So as far as I'm concerned, this really is kind of par for the course in a lot of evangelical circles. And they could have put any face they wanted on this. I've seen other examples of things like this where evangelicals will latch onto something in the mainstream and try to weaponize it for their purposes. Yes. And that and this is just another example and I've I've I saw it even as far back as my teenage years. I saw things like popular music, popular movies, characters in books and movies and whatever being put up on pedestals and us being told, you know, what's being said in this story verifies what it says in this part of the Bible. Now, did they actually go back and and provide any kind of scriptural, biblical foundation for any of this, or was it all Lord no, of the Rings? They really didn't. I mean, they. I think they related it to the Exodus or something because this was a prophetess who was talking. So they called it an apostolic decree. An apostolic decree from J.R.R. Tolkien. Apparently. Okay. I'm amazed that they didn't pull out Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Yeah. So I... I don't know why they didn't just pull that out of the box. I guess that Gandalf was good enough. Yeah. One of the other guys just told the audience that faith without works is dead. And then they led them in a work to demonstrate their faith. And the work was banging on the floor with a stick and yelling. Yeah. What we used to call in in Wicca raising energy. 
Right. Pretty exactly much. Exactly what they're doing. So many parallels. So many yeah. parallels. But you know what? Not really a Christians behaving badly, just Christians behaving on par with what they've been taught. Right. And, and dealing with something on a level that has become very, very normalized in their circles. It's humorous to a degree. It's infuriating to a degree. Yeah. Um, what I do know is that it did absolutely nothing to advance the cause of Black Lives Matter. Right. Or, it did nothing. Yeah. But I also don't think that that was the point. I think the point was to be seen and to be perceived right. as having done something. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's very important that we understand the concept of balance and also the concept of activism. They did this as a, as a show of activism. Right. But it was very ineffective. If they want to do something activist, then they should be hitting the streets. They should be using the hashtag. Right. They should be doing something that doesn't involve magic, that can yeah. actually benefit somebody who, um, or that can, act, that can actually benefit the people group that this movement is, is out there to protect and raise awareness about. It's very shallow. It's very skin deep. It's not going into the deeper roots and rooting out the ideas that we've all been taught our entire lives. Right. Because the, the whole point of this is look at me. Right. That's more the point of it than anything is the attention that they wanted to get from this. And like I said before, the whole concept of, well, we did something now. Right. You know what? Do better. So onward into our main segment here tonight, I want to talk in depth about this concept of love and how it gets flip turned upside down in most evangelical circles. Now, I've said many times on this show before that you can't find a single instance, Old or New Testament, where God or Jesus looks at any individual and says, I love you. I love you like a parent. I want to protect you. I want to shelter you. I want the best for you. I care about you. You don't see any of this anywhere in scripture. The only time that you ever see God's love mentioned anywhere, it's from third party sources right. who, whose perception of what love is, was already so skewed that they don't understand what it is that they're praising and lauding and worshiping here. I really honestly believe that if they did, if they really understood the nature of this God that they've created in their minds, they could never, ever, ever look at him as loving because he just flat out isn't. You are exponentially more likely to be killed by Yahweh in the Old Testament than you are to be blessed. Right. And that is significant. And when you think about what the words on these pages in this book do to the human mind, all you have to do is recognize and this is a bitter pill for a lot of Christians to swallow, but it's absolutely true. When you look at all of the world religions out there, there isn't a one out there that can hold a candle to Christianity when it comes to crimes against humanity, atrocities that have been exacted on other people, wars and bloodshed. Christianity has every other religion out there beaten by a country mile when it comes to hate, when it comes to bloodshed, when it comes to all of the things that we point fingers at other religions like Islam, when we, when we point fingers at these other religions and say, well, they're responsible for this, well, guess what? For every act of atrocity that has been exacted on an individual or a group of people by Muslims, I would have to wager there had to be multiplied thousands that were waged against people, individuals, people, groups in Christian circles throughout the years. It wasn't the Muslims that started the Spanish Inquisition. It was not the Muslims that started the Crusades. It was not the Muslims that, um, that started the Ku Klux Klan or any of the other just myriad of hate groups that are, that are listed. Um, but what is that source? I know there's a specific source that lists all the hate groups and, and I've, I've gone I've Southern, mentioned it. What was Southern it? Southern Poverty Law Center. Yes, Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, there are so many, so many groups that are identified 
as hate groups that have their roots in Christianity and particularly evangelical Christianity, that this becomes a really, really difficult thing to ignore. Because one thing that all of those groups have in common is that they believe that they're right. They believe that their cause is righteous. They believe that they are doing something good for humanity for speaking out against these people that they hate, that they outwardly hate. Okay, no, that's not, that's not the point. The point is that everybody learns how to live with each other and starts just treating each other like we're people. That's the solution, not just eradicating a group of people that you don't particularly like for no reason. But these are things that their own God teaches them. I mean, let's just talk about a few examples here. The Hebrew Yahweh in Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21 advocates killing teenagers for mouthing off and partying. Mm. Okay. Um, Numbers 15, 32 through 36 talks about stoning people for gathering sticks on the Sabbath or one individual in particular who, to whom that sentence was handed down. The Hebrew Yahweh advocates for rapists and teach people how to own other people as property. Um, these in Exodus, uh, Exodus 21 is all about owning slaves. Exodus 22, 16 and 17 talks about what happens if you get caught raping someone. Well, you have to buy her from her father mm-hmm. and you have to marry her like she would want to marry you. I it, think it's, it's crazy. Um, but I've brought that up before and it's, it's, it's another one that, that a lot of, um, that I hear a lot on atheist podcasts and atheist talk shows, um, these are two major, major bones of contention in a lot of atheist circles, because how can a God who is a loving God and considers everyone on this planet to be his children, how can you sell your daughter to her rapist or say that it's okay? How can you advocate for owning other people as property? Well, the Hebrew Yahweh does and provides a very extensive handbook for how to do it right in Exodus 21. Let's also take a look at how this particular God solves every single problem there is with violence. He acts, he never, he never acts as a mediator, counselor, advocate, or even the voice of reason in any human conflict unless it makes him look good. Mm. Who does that sound like? Mm. And we wonder why evangelicals think that he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah. The Hebrew Yahweh never teaches anyone any valuable life lessons. Even most of the parables that Jesus told had skewed messages. There was more than one thing going on and more than one way that you could interpret that story. So even, even in these, these object lessons that Jesus used to try to get people to understand certain concepts a little bit better, there were undertones of all kinds of hate and division that went through even even some of the best of the parables, the ones that have even the best of messages, there are, there are undercurrents of all kinds of divisiveness. And I, I've given some examples of this on, on previous shows. I would love to take a look at some of these parables and just really dissect them and show what the actual agenda is behind a lot of them because there, there's the obvious message And then there's the underlying message. And this is what I was talking about with this indoctrination, especially with racism. It's the underlying messaging in textbooks. It's the underlying messaging in popular media. It permeates everything. And when you look at just the way that certain things are presented in the Bible, especially this concept of God being loving, there's this undercurrent through the entire thing well, yes, God did all these things, but he's still loving. He still loves you. And there's a reason why all of these things are happening to you and why he's not stepping in and why he's not intervening. Uh, they never get around to telling you what those answers are. There's just one verse that I know of, and I forget what the reference is off the top of my head, where it says that the rain falleth on the just and the unjust alike. Right. And I've heard that as as an excuse for, you know, why do bad things happen to good people and bad people a lot of times don't get their comeuppance. Well, the rain falleth on the just and the unjust alike. And that's about all that they can, all that they can say about it. That's about 
all that they have to work with when it comes to trying to come up with an explanation for that. When you look at the Hebrew Yahweh and his attitudes toward people, his words, his actions, and his example are a breeding ground for bigotry and egoism. This whole concept of eternal torture for finite offenses. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine exacting a punishment on my kid that goes longer than like a week for anything, for anything. Now, if he committed a major crime and had to be incarcerated, that's a different thing. But, you know, even incarceration ends, whether you get out or you die, it ends. We're talking about a God who thinks that it's okay to basically roast you on a spit for all eternity for crimes like just not loving him back and not accepting Christ as your personal savior, even though you live in a part of the world where the gospel message is just gobbledygook mm -hmm. and you'll never be able to understand it because this God also made a very broad diversity of people with a very broad diversity of personalities and thought patterns and ways of seeing the world. And to the vast majority of the world, Christianity would never make any sense. In some cultures, they have to change translations of the Bible because if you, if you say in certain cultures that Jesus is the good shepherd, that makes him out to be an untouchable. But if you, if you frame him as the good pig farmer mm. in some of those same cultures, now he's got status. So in most parts of the world, the gospel message doesn't really mean a whole hell of a lot. And not a whole hell of a lot of people are going to really understand it either. And that's problematic because if this is the one and only true way to achieve eternal salvation and these people that this God has made who will never be able to understand the gospel message well enough to accept it for themselves, they all get to die. Not only do they get to die but they get to be tortured for all eternity because their God made them a certain way. And that way didn't jibe with how he wanted them to think. Well, then you know what? He should have made them in a manner that they could think that way or better yet, just fucking reveal yourself. Mm -hmm. Just let people know who you are, that you are there, what you want from them. If you made them, then you understand all of them. So reveal yourself in a way that's going to motivate people to want to know you, want to love you, want to serve you. Words on a page written by Bronze Age humans with certain influences from certain parts of the world are not going to have universal appeal or significance. People will simply not understand the gospel message and will reject it on the basis of not being able to understand it or... They'll just go through their entire lives and never hear it because Christians, with all due respect, haven't been all that diligent with their great commission. Now, have they? Hmm. Two thirds of this world has still never heard the gospel message. And I don't think that's a bad thing. But I think that over the course of 2000 years, it's kind of a shitty record. <laughs> but there are reasons. There are reasons why it hasn't spread as far as it has. And it has a lot to do with cultural barriers it has to do with the fact that the Eastern mind versus the Western mind, very, very, very different things. The way that someone from Japan thinks is going to be a lot different than the way someone from France or England thinks. Um, the way that somebody from India thinks is going to be way different, even from the way that somebody in Australia or New Zealand think. It's just the way that it is. And when you try to make this concept of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, a universal thing that everyone is supposed to understand, but that no, that not everyone is ever going to understand, then this entire system is built with failure, built into it. And God has to know that these people are going to go off to an eternal hell of torture because of the way he made them. I'm sorry, but what kind of asshole is your God anyway? Mm. So... Before I get too hot under the collar over that particular issue, I also started thinking about this concept while I was putting this, um, this episode together. And it's one that I have touched on a little bit before in the past that I want to really expand on here. I've said before that if I was the father of a teenage daughter and the Hebrew Yahweh showed up at my door to take her on a date, mm. 
mm-hmm. I would be very, very, very concerned. So I want to expand just a little bit on this concept of God as an abusive partner and how God and the average abusive partner look alike. For starters, both God and the average abusive partner demand exclusive loyalty. You can't even look at another God. And if you do, it's going to cause all kinds of problems. Both place undue demands on your time. Now, I've told this story before too, where there was a time when I was in church at least five times a week for different things. I mean, granted, there were things like Taekwondo that didn't really have a whole lot to do with with um, with indoctrination, although the guy who ran the class was evangelical. We did pray at the beginning and end. There, there was that aspect of it. We were at a church and we were going to do things his way. And that was that. But there were plenty of other avenues of indoctrination. And they wanted you in that building as much as possible. At a very minimum, they really encouraged that you were there on Wednesday nights. Right. And that you came back on Friday for youth group. Mm-hmm. Now, I know not all churches do all of this and do it all this way, but I've seen plenty that do. So Wednesday night for quote unquote family night, which yeah. is like indoctrination classes yes. more than anything else. It's basically Sunday school. Yeah. Sunday school on Wednesday. Yeah. And that was pretty much it. But they, they were a little bit more in depth. The, the subjects of these classes, a little bit more in depth than what you were going to get on, on a Sunday morning. Um, and then our church, most of the churches that I had been involved with had youth group either on Friday or on Sunday afternoon. Um, most Pentecostal churches that I saw out there had morning and evening services on Sunday and you were encouraged mm-hmm. to be at both. So if this was one of those churches that did their youth group on Sunday, Sunday was was accounted for. You didn't really have a whole lot of family time, even though they, with their, with their lips, they encouraged going home and having a nice family meal together and all of that. But then it was rush, 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 get back to church because at four o'clock there's going to be youth group. And then at six o'clock, there's going to be service or whatever the, the scheduling was, but they wanted you in church or they wanted us. I'll use my, my own experience as the example here. They wanted us in church twice on Sunday. And they wanted us there on Wednesday. And if we were in the right age category for youth group, they wanted us there on Friday. So that's four times in one week, just right there. Add Taekwondo to the list. And I was up to five. Add um, peer care, mm-hmm. which I talked about in a previous episode and really don't want to get back into. Uh, add that into the mix. And now I'm doing something for the church on Thursday night too. Mm-hmm. Where does it end? I mean, it was... I I think there was maybe one weeknight during my week where I wasn't in church. And this is all by design. Very, very undue demands on your time. And if you aren't willing to do any of this stuff, you're guilted over it. And if you don't show up at youth group for a few weeks in a row, then the van is going to show up outside your house and the youth pastor and three youth members are going to come inside and talk to you. Mm -hmm. That was what peer care was. And if you miss Sunday school, you're going to get a friendly greeting card in the mail during that week saying, we missed you. No, we, they didn't miss you. They're watching you. Very, very undue demands on your time. Both the Hebrew Yahweh and the abusive partner threaten you with violence if you leave them. Okay. So, so in the, um, in the example of Yahweh, there is this looming threat of eternal torture and punishment if you don't outwardly express your love and devotion to him in various ways. And I've heard many, many examples of people who have stayed in abusive relationships for way longer than they wanted to because they were convinced, mostly because their partner said so right out loud, that they would be hurt or killed if right. they left. Okay? So what's being threatened here? You leave daddy and you're going to roast on a spit for all eternity. Mm. So there's another, another thing to check off of that list. As I was researching this particular point, it just jumped into the back of my mind. Well, what about the prodigal son? Right. Because his life actually got better after he came back. He was allowed to leave and wasn't threatened. But when the money ran out, the money was out. Now, here's the real dangerous 
aspect of this story. As I thought about this, it became apparent to me what was really going on in the parable of the prodigal son. You see, like, I, like I've said before, there's the obvious message and then there's the underlying message. And you know what the underlying message is in the prodigal son? It's that it's all good if you just come back to daddy. Mm -hmm. You'll feel better if you come back to me. You're not happy. You can't make it on your own. You need me. Come back and just let daddy love you a little bit. You know, that's, that's the, the underlying message there because not all abusive partners are going to argue and fight and threaten. They're just going to sit there on the couch while you pack your things and leave. And then the expectation is, well, as soon as she starts to miss me, she'll be back. As soon as she realizes that she can't afford rent on her own, she'll be back. And all of these things stick in the back of their minds and they just sit and they wait it out or they find somebody else to, uh, to play with while they sit and wait it out. And it's empowering. It is empowering to them when, when their partners, when their abused partners come back. So again, very, very much like the Hebrew Yahweh, if you want to use the prodigal son as the example, because what did daddy do? He just sat back and waited. It's like, oh, he'll be back. He'll be back. He's going to run out of money. And he'll be back. And that's precisely what happened. And this is the way that this particular God wants you to view him and where the two of you stand in the relationship. Both the Hebrew Yahweh and your average abusive partner will do everything in their power to make you believe that you will never be happy without them and that you need them. I put these in as two separate points, but they're kind of in the same area. They're kind of in the same category. I've heard this too. It's, it's kind of the, the polar opposite of what I just described, where the abusive partner just sits there on the couch and watches her leave or watches his partner leave. Um, it's, this is kind of the, the, the other end of the spectrum here, the other extreme where he follows his partner around the house and starts screaming in her face. You'll never make it without me. You need me. You'll never be happy out there with anybody else. No one else out there will want to have anything to do with you. These are all things that relate very, very profoundly to evangelical Christianity because I mean, what do they tell you about your religion? No other religion is going to satisfy you. No other religion can save you. No other God out there is able to do for you what I can do for you. So you might as well stay. I know that it's not fun being my disciple. I know that it's not fun having to pretend to love me all the time, but the alternatives here are way, way worse. And you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound pretty much like what God is saying here? Yeah. What, what, uh, what the underlying message of the gospel is, you see the gospel, the gospel is supposed to be something that's, that's really, really positive and good for humanity. But there's that underlying message of death and destruction and God loves you. But if you don't <laughs> repent, he's going to fry your face off. Yeah. This was an actual line from a Christian comedy sketch yep. that I remember listening to back in the mid to late ish eighties from a comedy team called Mitch and Allen. They were an offshoot of another Christian comedy team called Isaac air freight. And I can remember them starting out one of their bits with that line. God loves you, but if you don't repent, he's going to fry your face off. Right. Is that not the perfect picture of what the gospel is really saying? Who is it? It's Jesus. Let me in. Why? I need to save you from what? from what I'm going to do to you if you don't let me in. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what you're dealing with. You'll never be happy and you need them. Okay? Not only will you never be happy, but you'll, you'll be dead and you'll be tortured for all eternity. That's a nice soul you've got there. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a shame if something bad were to happen to it? Yeah. I mean, let's, let's just use the, the mafia example. I've heard, uh, I've heard that one many times in, in, uh, atheist circles also. And it applies, mm. it applies well, neither the Hebrew Yahweh nor your average abusive partner has any real sense of loyalty. You have to toe every moral and ethical line in front of him, but he can behave however he wants. Mm -hmm. 
you have to be faithful to him, but he can sleep with whoever he wants. Okay? You, you have to maintain certain things about yourself. Your weight, your looks, whatever. He can let himself completely go. And as far as he's concerned, as long as he's bringing home the paychecks, then he can dictate what you look like, how you dress, who you talk to. And with all due respect, sometimes it's the abused partner who's bringing in the paychecks and he still sits there as entitled as can be mm -hmm. and expects her to simply do for him. That's an abusive partner. And let's talk about little things like tithing. And let's talk about concepts like I must decrease so he can increase. These are all tactics that abusive partners mm -hmm. use to get their partners to believe that they are less than what they actually are. And that is the way that the Hebrew Yahweh chooses to deal with these children whom he loves. Both an abusive partner and the Hebrew Yahweh claim that if you are unhappy, it's your fault. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It has nothing to do with how I feel about myself or my own self-esteem, but it's the fact that I'm in this relationship with this awesome God. And that's what's supposed to make me feel good about me because it isn't supposed to be about me. I'm supposed to die to myself, remember? Mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to have an identity. I'm not supposed to have any sense of who I am. And if I'm unhappy, it's because I am not surrendering enough control to my God to be able to tap into that joy. You see, that was a huge concept that I remember having drilled into me as a young person is the fact that, and I always, I was always depressed. I always had pretty heavy self-esteem issues, but I had also convinced myself that it was my fault, that God had given me all of the tools that I needed to not feel this way. And if I still felt this way, it was because I wasn't communicating with him the way that I should. I wasn't praying as much as I should. I wasn't reading my Bible as much as I should. I wasn't doing enough at that church. I was there five fucking times a week, but I'm not doing enough. That's why I feel like this. I need to find something else to do so that I can feel good about what I am doing for my creator and savior who has, who has past tense now saved me from an eternal torture in hell saved me from what he will do to me. It makes absolutely no sense. When you really bring it down to brass tacks, it's just the way that I described it. What are you being saved from? Precisely what he will do to you if you don't let him in. And that is the definition of an abusive partner. Both the Hebrew Yahweh and the average abusive partner try to use how they contribute to the relationship to justify their behavior. When speaking through the prophets, Yahweh had a tendency to preface comments by reminding the hearer of all of the things that he had done. After all I've done for you, this is how you're going to treat me? I mean, that's another line that your average abusive partner will use. I do all of this shit for you, and you don't appreciate any of it. And going into litanies of things, I work 12 hours a day, and I do this, and I do that, and this is the thanks that I get. This, this is how you repay me for all, all the things that I do for you. Well, you know what? When Yahweh was talking to the prophets, he had a tendency to preface anything that he had to say to them by reminding him of things that he had done in the past and how he had flexed his power. So there was always that underlying threat of, I'm in charge here. I've done all of this for you. You owe me this now. And that right there is, and again, it's another, an, another defining example of what an abusive partner will do to you and the mind games that an abusive partner will do to you. Now, I've said many times before, I don't think that, you're, that most pastors out there or quote unquote spiritual leaders have any of this in mind when they're teaching you these things. But I also don't think that your average social studies teacher has turning you into a racist in mind with the stuff that they're teaching. It's just that the stuff is out there and it's been accepted for so long that no one really gets around to thinking about arguing any of these points until they're no longer in that environment, until they've learned to think a little bit better, until they've learned to think, period.
I, I said many, many times that I was too smart for this. And I was, but my brain was on hold for a really, really long time because the indoctrination had done a very, very good job with me. And if you have become indoctrinated to believe that God is love, then think about some of these examples that I just gave you. Demands of exclusive loyalty, undue demands on your time, threats and intimidation, telling you that you'll never be happy without them, making you believe that you need them, not being anywhere near as loyal to you as you are to them, and trying to justify their bad behavior by showcasing the things that they actually do to keep the relationship together. These are all things that your God uses to keep you in line and to keep you believing that you are being loved and cared for when in reality you are only being controlled and not loved. Show me, show me an example of this miscreant God ever saying that he loves anyone. I dare you. There isn't a single example of this God taking anyone aside and making any proclamation of love that would be common for a parent dealing with their child. It just isn't there. I want to talk a little bit now about the subject of forgiveness because love and forgiveness go hand in hand. Forgiveness is the foundational concept of salvation. You are being forgiven for these so-called sins that you've committed based on the criteria laid out by the judge and juror in the case. And evangelicals are really, 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 really bad at forgiving. It's a thing that I've noticed probably before I was even an evangelical. Things that I saw, things that I can remember from way, way, way back. Christians in general have a real problem with this because I think that this actually goes back to my Catholic upbringing and the way that a lot of people in my life when I was younger used to deal with each other or dealt with children under their charge because I've, I've had many conversations with Shell about the um, principal at the parochial school yeah. that I went to for mm -hmm. K through five. Uh, not a whole hell of a lot of love going on there, mm -hmm. but she was supposed to be you know representative of certain virtuous aspects of, of her religion and her faith. And yet she was one of the angriest people that I recall ever knowing. I mean, how angry do you have to be before you start even thinking about pulling a kid out of an assembly where there's a comedy sketch going on on the stage and a kid has the audacity to laugh out loud? Mm. This person was so offended by my laughter at one point that she dragged me out of an assembly and brought me to the office and chastised me for creating a scene. Mm. There was something funny happening on the stage. I laughed. She didn't like that very much. Mm. She didn't like it at all. And that was the type of person that was in charge of literally hundreds of students between kindergarten and eighth grade. And this was one of the primary examples that we got of someone who was supposed to be spiritual, someone who was supposed to be reflecting to us attributes of this God who was supposed to love us. And there I am being physically pulled from an assembly by my arm because I laughed too loud at something that was funny. So it goes back long before I set foot in any kind of Pentecostal evangelical church. It started way, way back then. Um, people joke all the time about Catholic guilt. Mm. Well, those of us who have made our way out of religions and situations like that can see the humor in it, but it's not really all that much of a laughing matter in the grander scheme of things, because there are plenty of people who go through their entire lives with those feelings of guilt and inadequacy. And I think that that's very sad because you can't actualize your potential when you are constantly telling yourself that you are inadequate. Mm. So it's not just an evangelical thing. It's a Christianity thing in general. I have found that evangelicals in particular are among the worst at forgiving of anybody that I know, which is really interesting when you consider that in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, it says that you basically need to forgive to the extent that you want to be forgiven. So 
if you're holding grudges against people, if you are not just letting go of the bad feelings when somebody does you wrong and just forgiving them sight unseen, whether they ask you to or not, you are going against one of the key mandates that your so-called savior put out there and told you that you have to follow. But you know what? It goes right back to the same thing that I say about this every single time a thought like this comes into my head. There isn't a religion out there that is going to change human nature. Mm -hmm. There isn't a religion out there that is going to change the person that you are. At the end of the day, people are going to do what they want. My mother and her husband should never have been allowed to be married because my father was still alive for a lot of years after she married the guy that she's with now. And yet she managed to convince not one, but two of the pastors in our church to stand up and officiate for them. Mm -hmm. People are going to do what they want. And that means that regardless of what your so-called savior threatens you with, if you don't want to forgive somebody, you're just not going to forgive them. So it has absolutely nothing to do with your religion. It has to do with how you are wired as a person. And it also has to do with the choices that you make as to how happy you want to be. Because I'll tell you, there, there, were, there were some people back in the day that got it right. We were talking about Randy Stonehill before we, yeah. before we started rolling the mic. And no, I'm not going to talk about American fast food. <laughs> going to talk about a different going to talk about a different song that I can remember the, the lyrics too well. It was a song called The Gods of Men. Mm. And I think if I have to pull these lyrics out at a moment's notice, I think the words were I used to dream of tasting vengeance, wanted my enemies to crawl in sweat. Well, my happiness was drained from reliving all the pain. Now I'm learning to forgive and forget. Mm. So sometimes they get it right. right, but that whole concept, it may be biblical, but you don't see a whole lot of examples of it coming from anyone who matters in mm -hmm. scripture. Right. So Jesus can say, okay, forgive to the extent that you want to be forgiven. If you choose not to forgive people, then I'm going to choose not to forgive you. Well, that stings for a second, but at the end of the day, if you're going to hold that grudge, you're going to hold that grudge. But I can tell you from experience that Randy was right. You'll spend way more time hashing over how bad it makes you feel when in reality, that person probably doesn't spend anywhere near as much time thinking about this shit as you do. Mm -hmm. So the only person being hurt by you withholding forgiveness is you. So forget about any spiritual anything. And let's talk about your mental health and your emotional well-being. Forgiveness is a very good idea. Now, I'm not saying don't hold people accountable. What I am saying is that there comes a point where just for your own peace of mind and for your own wellness, there has to be a way past that. And maybe in your case, it's not a decision to simply forgive. Maybe it's a matter of now I have to learn how to deal with well, what has happened to me and I need to get into therapy and I need to think better about this so that, so that my mind doesn't always go back to this person and what they did. It's a form of forgiveness. You don't have to necessarily forgive your rapist or forgive your abuser, but you can start by working on those thoughts in a way that's a little bit more constructive and therapy is a great place to start for something like that. And after a while, Maybe you won't be able to forgive it, but you might be able to let go of it just enough to remember what it was like before and be just a little bit happier. In certain trauma situations, it's all that we can really hope for. It doesn't have to be anything majorly life impacting. It can be that argument that you got into with somebody years ago, that it's the first thing that you still think of when you think about that person. Maybe start thinking about some other memories that involve that person. And, you know, I, there's one person that keeps running through my mind where I keep thinking about the last time that we were together and the words that were spoken and the fact that that was five years ago now. But I also remember that there have been multiple points of relatability between me and this person that go back further, that 
I am right now choosing to focus my attention on more than the more than the negative aspects of the relationship later on. There have been moments and granted they have been fleeting moments because this relationship has always been volatile. But there have been moments where I saw some very strong points of relatability with this person and said, you know what? If we would both just bury the hatchet long enough, I think that we would see that there's a lot in common here. She's still an evangelical. And even though I've extended the olive branch, I have not heard from her. It's been six months. I'm trying because you know what? I try to practice what I preach and I know what it feels like to carry anger and resentment and hurt and hate. And it's not fun. These are ugly emotions and they don't deserve a disproportionate amount of your time. They'll always be there, but you don't have to feed them mm. and you don't have to make an entire thought process out of them. You don't have to have the bad things about people in situations being the only things that you think about when those things come to your mind. But it's a whole hell of a lot more difficult to get past that stuff if you don't understand the concept of forgiveness and you will not learn it in evangelical Christianity because and just like everything else, there are so many layers to what forgiveness is between what it says in the Bible and what you see in practice, both in the practice of this miscreant deity who's in charge of it all and in the practice of his so-called followers. You see so much of the ugly that it's hard to redirect those thoughts in a more productive direction. If you're hurting over something or someone, especially if it has to do with this religion and you're harboring resentment, start thinking a little bit more about some of the things that you did get out of it, the people that you met, some of the good experience that you had, because you know what? I didn't think that all of it was bad. I still look back at my youth group days with a lot of fond memories, and I got one friend from back in that time period who we like to reminisce about certain things and people and things that happened. And I don't think that we have ever sat there and talked about any of the negative things that happened because this guy has it right. He remembers all the fun stuff and he loves to recall all the crazy stuff that we did and the fun things that we did, the trips that we went on, um, just things that happened in youth group meetings. He likes to remember these things and he likes to bring them up. And you know what? It's helped me, especially in the last couple of years to start thinking a little bit differently about that time in my life. Yes, there were things that I missed out on. Yes, there were things that were just absolutely unnecessary that I had to do or not do when I was part of this. Yes, I gave a really disproportionate amount of my time to it, and I didn't have a normal teenage existence because of it. But you know what? There were a lot of people that were regulars in that youth group who went through the same things that I did and came out pretty well adjusted this friend of mine in particular. And I think that it really has to do with getting to a point where you can let go. I've said it before, like very first episode, you've got to let go of the time lost. You've got to let go of the hurt. You've got to let go of all of the negative things that were part of this. Because that, I believe, is how you're really going to start getting your mind unbound. It's how you are going to start healing. And it comes down to understanding that there is a huge difference between what the Bible calls love and what love actually is. There's a huge difference between forgiving someone because your religion says to forgive them and not really forgiving them and really honestly and truly letting that thing go or doing what you need to do to deal with it so it doesn't eat you up inside. It's very important. So as I was doing my research for this, I found some other very, very interesting details about what this does to you psychologically, what being an even just being an evangelical can do to you psychologically, um, the levels of judgment and decidedly not 
loving and forgiving behavior that is common among evangelicals has even given rise to a unique personality disorder. Now, in clinical terms, personality disorders are generally, um, they're, they're generally lumped into three specific clusters. You have cluster A, cluster B, cluster C. Cluster A, and if, if I'm, if I'm, at all off about any of this, then any, anyone out there can feel free to correct me, but this is the way that I understand it. Cluster A personality disorders are more on the multiple personality schizo schizophrenia end of the spectrum. Cluster B personality disorders, um, they present mostly with a lack of emotional control. You get things like narcissism and borderline personality disorder, and there's even borderline narcissism and other things that are that are in between the cracks with those two. Those are all cluster B. Cluster C disorders are more anxiety-based, and that mm -hmm. right there is where several evangelical concepts start to gain a foothold. So the, um, the, the disorder is called evangelical persecution disorder, and most clinicians will tuck this away in cluster B, but it also has some strong cluster C traits as well. There are concepts that really get rooted in your brain as an evangelical that start causing these kinds of disruptions in your personality. Nobody loves me is a big one. I mean, that's cluster C to the hilt right there. Okay. That's, that's anxiety. And that is one of the main, one of the bigger issues that people with anxiety deal with. They believe that nobody loves them or cares about them. Mm -hmm. Now add to that the fact that you're not really allowed to love yourself no, as an evangelical. Not. I must decrease so he can increase. I have to die to myself. I have to take up my cross daily and follow Christ and not have an identity and not be allowed to feel good about me. Nobody loves me. Well, guess what? That, that includes me too. I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed to love myself because I'm supposed to view myself as unlovable and unworthy of God's love. If I can't make God love me, how can I expect my friends, my spouse, or my kids to love me either? See, that's, that's the real danger there. The cluster B part of this comes from never having straight in your head what love and forgiveness are because of all of the mixed signals that you get between what's in the Bible, what you get from your pulpit, and what you see other people around you doing. So, as an evangelical, you get all of these concepts skewed in your head and it creates a cluster B thought pattern. You don't know what love is. You don't know what forgiveness is. You don't know how to express either. And you don't know how to receive either. And that's another big problem. And that part, I'm going to get to that in a second. The whole not being able to receive it. There's a reason for that. Not being able to receive love because your developmental environment has taught you that you don't deserve it, and that you're supposed to believe that a God you can't see or feel or receive love from in the first place just loves you, and that's that. No proof, no evidence. You don't feel any better. You certainly don't feel your God close to you, but he loves you, and you are required to simply accept that. These assaults on people's thoughts are continuous, and they are aggressive in evangelical Christianity. Christians are constantly encouraged to rededicate their lives to the Lord because they're living lives and engaging in behaviors that are not in line with someone who has been offered eternal salvation. You must repent again. Even though the atonement was supposed to be a once and for all proposition, you have to keep asking over and over and over for your forgiveness and for your, sal and for your salvation. Over and over and over again, you are encouraged and compelled and coerced mm -hmm. to come down to that altar and rededicate your life because you're just not fucking good enough. Are you sure? Are you certain? Are you sure you're certain? Oh, God. Yeah. And, uh. and, and I love the humorous angle that yeah. a lot of these uh, youth speakers used to take with that. Yeah. And it's like you're making a joke of it. But it's not a joke. It really isn't a joke. No, there, it's, it's not a laughing matter because this, it, it's setting up thought processes that are going to take these people through the rest of their lives. And they will never feel good enough for anything or anyone. Mm -hmm. And that right there is a real major ass problem. Okay. It's a huge problem. Um, you're never good enough 
and your daddy never understands you, let alone tries to offer you any kind of emotional support when it's needed. And the reason why is because he's just not fucking there. Mm -hmm. You can't get support from a non-entity. You can't get empathy. You cannot get understanding, patience, love, compassion. These things are not going to come to you if you are looking for them in a character in a book. And that is all this God is was or ever will be i'm just putting that right out there i'm a good atheist i'm not going to sit here and say that there is unequivocally no god but i will say unequivocally that if there is a god this one ain't it mm -hmm. it's that simple this one simply is not it and I'm sorry if I feel like I'm I'm putting that thought in your head like, like a pile driver, but you know what? Someone needs to just say it and say it outright. This relationship that you think you are in with this deity is nothing but a fantasy. Ever notice how often you and your God agree on things when you sit down to pray about something? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason for that too, because you already know what the right thing is and your brain is programmed to try and do the right thing when it can, because as civilized human beings, we don't really want to bring harm to ourselves or to each other, or at least to the point where we don't want to deal with the consequences of bad actions. It keeps us from doing certain things and it keeps us from thinking about things in certain ways. And yes, it does allow us to make sound and pragmatic decisions about things without the aid or help of an invisible and unattentive deity. We have the power to make good decisions and to be good people without any of that. And I do, I, I sympathize and I empathize, and empathize is a better word. I empathize with the average evangelical in this arena. I really do because it is very, very tough showing love or extending forgiveness when your examples of what these things are come from a book that doesn't understand them. Mm -hmm. It's tough when that book is the foundation of a faith in a God who is incapable of showing any kind of parental compassion, nurturing love or support by virtue of his supposed nature in and of itself, and by virtue of the fact that he is, once again, fictional. It's tough when the only actual examples that you see of any of this are the manifestations of evangelical indoctrination that you see in other people that has trained their brains to see hate as love and love as hate. No loving God commits genocide. No loving God teaches people how to own other people as property. No loving God kills someone for picking up a stick. No loving God tells a parent to, to kill their child because the child is a rabble rouser and is in some way, shape, or form disobedient or disrespectful. No loving God enacts infinite punishment for finite offenses. But all of these things are manifestations of things that we as evangelicals were taught from the very first time someone said, open your Bibles too. We've been taught that love is hate and that hate is love. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Don't you love that one? Mm. I mean, it's one, it's one of those things that I heard a lot um, when it came to things like homosexuality, right? alternative lifestyles, things that people do that go directly against what you know to be, quote unquote, right, because the Bible tells you that this is right and this is wrong. And, that there, and there are so many absolutes that you have to adhere to. Let me tell you something, folks. Hate has no place in a religion whose foundation is one of forgiveness. The two cannot, cannot occupy the same space. You cannot love the sinner and hate the sin. You have to accept and embrace that person as they are and deal with the things that you don't like about them. Love the sinner, hate the sin? No, hating the sin is not the, the answer. How about love the sinner and try to understand them a little bit better? Try to understand why they have adopted this lifestyle 
that just seems icky to you. Because that's most of the problem, isn't it? <laughs> the notion of gay sex makes you uncomfortable. So because you don't want it, no one else should be doing it. Bullshit. It's none of your business. Learn what love is. Put down your Bible and start learning what love is because you're not going to learn it there. You're going to learn it by starting to look a little bit deeper within your own self, starting to like yourself, starting to know you a little bit better. Then you'll start understanding that your preferences are just that. They're your preferences. That what you look at as right and wrong may be very different than what somebody else views as right and wrong. There are certain absolutes out there. You can't just go out and murder somebody. You can't just go out and rape somebody or stab somebody or even hit somebody. There are, there are certain things out there that are just, you know, that society is right about when it comes to right and wrong. But there are all kinds of gray areas when you start using words like sin. A bunch of episodes back, we talked about getting past the concept of sin. There's no such thing as sin, people. There's no such thing as sin. There are actions and there are consequences, and that is it. And sometimes when people do bad things, there are no consequences. Sometimes when people strive to do good things, where, where, where does that, um, that saying come from? No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're trying to do the right thing, it blows up in your face. That's life. There are no guarantees. And loyalty to a specific religion and a specific God who doesn't understand love is not going to get you to a place where you love yourself more. No religion that expects you to decrease so that this invisible and uninvolved deity can increase is ever going to teach you anything about you or teach you anything about love. Racism, homophobia, xenophobia, false patriotism, all of these things are possible earmarks of generations thick evangelical indoctrination even if the individual isn't particularly religious, because a lot of these concepts have trickled into society or have made their way out of society into evangelical circles because they jibe so damn well with the way that their God does things that it's just natural for them to adhere to these concepts. Now I'm going to talk about some very specific examples of this that I saw, particularly in college, um, either in college or at least during that time in my life. I started thinking about a few things over the, over the past few days, and I'll bet you um, re remember this one, because this yeah. one had such an impact on me that decades later, I still remember sitting in this classroom and having this in instructor, she wasn't a professor, she was an instructor, um, talk to us, give us a good heart to heart as students in this school because this is the way that the community was perceiving us. This person had gone into one of the local stores in town, gone into James Way. Yeah. If anybody remembers James Way, I think they're pretty much gone at this yeah, point. Yeah, they're gone. But she went into James Way to get some school supplies, so just some stuff for the beginning of the semester. And she mentioned to the well either she mentioned to the cashier that she was um that she was on the staff of the school or the cashier just recognized her and she was talking to the cashier about how she was, she was excited about the students coming back soon because this was right before the beginning of the fall semester. And apparently the cashier sort of gave her a little bit of a look or got a little bit tense or whatnot. And she asked her, is everything okay? And the cashier looks at her and says, you know, I don't want to offend you or anything. But I sure wouldn't mind these students coming in here, especially at this time of year, if they weren't all so rude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what your religion is teaching you. Love is. This is what you are projecting to your community, to the people around you. The gospel is not one of love. The gospel is one of pride. It is one of arrogance. It is one of intolerance and it is one of hate. Pure and simple. You cannot, under any circumstance, in any translation, in any effort of 
exegeting any verse in scripture, come up with an interpretation of God's quote unquote plan that is anything but those things that will teach you anything but those things. And that little story right there really does encapsulate a huge part of the problem. I wouldn't mind them coming in here if they weren't all so rude. Mm -hmm. I remember the superlative aspect of that. All. All. Just think about that. That was the type of personality disorder. That that place was encouraging and feeding into and developing in individuals. When I was on my internship, this was the summer of 92 going into 19, going into my last um, year of college, 92, 93 school year. There were so many things that happened that summer because the church that I was interning at, it was my home church, Faith Assembly in Poughkeepsie. And uh, it was a big church. It was a big facility. I mean, we maybe filled out half of the, um, of the available seats at that point, but it was a huge facility. So there were all kinds of functions. Well, our, I forget whether it was district council or if it was some kind of sectional thing. I think it was district council mm -hmm. that we wound up having at faith assembly that summer. Yeah. And I was the intern and some of the ways that I was spoken to and dealt with by some of these people who were coming in from all parts of New York and just basically treating the place like it was their living room. Mm. And sometimes with me not having any previous interaction with them or whatever, I had been asked to try and find someone or I had been asked to go to a specific location and tell somebody something because this was long before the days of cell phones mm -hmm. where you could just text somebody. So send the intern and there were things that I witnessed that that affected me both directly and indirectly that told me everything that I should have been able to, to surmise about these people and the way that they do things during that summer. And I should have turned tail and run. Mm -hmm. And there were moments when I wanted to. Yeah. There were many moments that summer where I wanted to because of the attitudes of people that I, that I came into contact with, even certain members of our own church who put on the face with me and smiled and acted like I was the greatest thing since sliced bread to my face were also turning around and making all kinds of complaints about me mm -hmm. behind my back. Yeah. We love you to your face, but now with you not standing right here in front of us, we're going to show our true colors and we're going to complain on you for this, that, and the other. And it wasn't even like interaction type stuff. It wasn't like I had had a conversation with somebody and he got mouthy with me. No, it was all things that they considered to be defective in the way that I did things, in the way that I managed certain things that were put in my charge. They just didn't like it. And it wasn't even a matter of coming up to me and approaching me and saying, hey, I have this problem with you. And that's kind of a Pauline principle, too. I think, isn't it? Yes. If you have a beef with somebody, to, aren't you supposed to? You're supposed to go to the person. Right. And talk to them first. And then you go with someone else. Yeah. If, if, they, if they don't respond to you in a positive right. way, then you come back with a witness. Right. And then if they don't respond to you, that's when you bring them basically before the board. Right. So that's, that, that's a Pauline principle that gets tossed completely out the window. And... You know, again, people are just going to do what they want. Yeah. And I never met a pastor who dealt with it in the way that the Bible says you should deal with it and asked that person, well, have you spoken to this person? No, because the Assemblies of God is largely a business and not a ministry. Perception and um, not perception. Image is everything. Mm -hmm. So, well, perception too, I guess, because this person's perception of what I did was what, what sparked on the conversation. And rather than lose that person's tithe, let's scapegoat the person that they're upset with. Yeah. You know, that's, that's pretty much the way that it worked. And that one, I didn't even, I didn't even put this one down and I'm amazed that I didn't think about it, but um, my exit from Christian radio 
had yeah. a lot to do with a situation like this where someone called the station on a Sunday night wanting to talk to someone who was only there during business hours. And I attempted to explain to this person several times that this person would not be here until the following morning that I could leave a message. But because we were in the middle of a major fundraiser, I couldn't guarantee that this person would get my message. It would just be better if you call back during business hours. And that was precisely how it was framed. I said, I will leave a message, but you should call anyway. I have no clue to this day what this person inflated that conversation into. But all I know is that I'm, I'm sitting there in my living room and being fired over the phone <laughs> by the general manager of the station because of whatever it was that this person said that I said or did. Now, hindsight being 2020, I was in a, I was in a radio studio. I could have recorded the conversation and probably should have when it started to heat up. Yeah. But at the same time, it was just a manifestation of this childish me, me, me sort of attitude mm -hmm. that is prevalent in a lot of evangelicals because when you're in a situation where you're not allowed to be you every now and then that assertion of me comes out and it comes out in force. Yeah. And that is what happened with this person is that she was not getting what she wanted at that moment. I was perceptively keep perceptibly keeping it from her. And she got angry. Yeah. I, to this day, have no clue how she recounted that conversation or things that were said. All I know is that in a heartbeat, I didn't have a job anymore. Yeah. And what I found interesting about that situation was that this person's husband had donated a lot of time and materials doing carpentry work around the station. So it was yet another one of those situations where they didn't want to lose that line of support and they didn't want to pay for their lumber. Mm. So let's scapegoat the Sunday night guy and yeah. be done with it. That was the way that they chose to deal with it. I didn't feel a whole lot of love in that situation. I didn't feel a whole lot of acceptance. No. Now I did manage to halfway talk my way back in the door with them but I didn't feel like it was a great idea to go back into that environment. Yeah. I knew I would miss it, but I also knew that it was just a matter of time before something else like that happened because there were already people there. And I had been told by people at the station who were afraid of me. And I didn't understand that at the time, but it had everything to do with, with the fact that my brain never latched on to all of that messaging to the point where I just accepted it blindly yeah. and people could see that and people were intimidated and they were afraid because they saw logic being inserted into their fairy tale and they didn't like it. And I wasn't doing it on purpose at that point. I was just doing what I thought I should be doing and using my own brain. But in evangelical circles, that's kind of a dangerous thing. That's not going to win you friends or influence people at all. No. So that was the big problem there was that I intimidated people that worked at that station because I thought differently. And I was, I, I had a much greater capacity to see the other person's point of view than they did. And I think that when this person called up and cried, about how I, she was treated the night before. And I was very professional with her. I'm sorry, especially under the circumstances. I mean, I'm trying to deal with an adult and still deal with her as an adult while she's sitting there, literally acting like a toddler. It's, it's difficult. And we're mm -hmm. going to talk about childlike faith in another episode, but that's pretty much what I was dealing with a grown person who was behaving like a toddler. And I had to be very careful to not condescend yeah, and to not start talking to her like she was a toddler. And I just, I maintained my cool and I affirmed for her that I was going to do what she asked me to do. And she ended the conversation by saying, Joe, you're impossible. Bam. And slams the phone down in my face. Well, I guess I, I don't know. I don't know what she was expecting me to do. In that instance, I was, I supposed to just stay there overnight and wait until nine o'clock when this person came in and relay the message. Was that my duty at that point? I have no idea. 
I don't know what was going through her mind, but I do know that I was fired not because of that, but because of what the station stood to lose right. if they didn't scapegoat me in that in that instance. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was that is what it was really all about. Just a couple more quick uh, quick points here before we before we wrap things up. Oh, this was this was another another story. I liked this guy a lot, and I had known him for a lot of years. Um, he was active in the Tresdius movement, and I still say that you know if if you have to be involved in any kind of evangelical movement, Tresdius and Vida Nueva are about the least toxic that you're going to yeah. find out there. Um, really, really good group of people, and I met this guy who I really, really, really liked. And when I met him, it, it wasn't even through the movement. He was just part of the movement. He was running a Christian bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I used to get a lot of my music there because I was doing a lot with music at that point. Before I worked at the radio station, I would DJ events. I was in the rotation to DJ the um, Christian skating rallies that we did as part of our sectional activities with the Assemblies of God. Mm -hmm. So once a month, I was spinning records and playing tapes and doing my thing in the DJ booth for everyone who was, uh, who was roller skating. So I would go to this guy's store and buy a lot of music. And do you remember how they had, I, I forget what label it was. It was Word Records, Sparrow. I think it was. Not Sparrow. It, wasn't it was Sparrow? One, no. Sparrow had their own thing. But okay. there was there was one of the one of the record labels had the buy four get one free yeah. thing where you you get four coupons and then you can get a record or tape for free. Right. Well, what this guy used to do whenever I went into that store and bought music, he had these these stickers like on a roll. Oh. And he would slap an, an extra one on there. So sometimes I was buying two or as few as one tape. And I would have enough stickers to come in and get a free tape. He would let me take the store demos home to review them and decide if I wanted to use them in skate rallies and whatnot. Right. Before I spent my money. Because no one was reimbursing me for this. I was buying this stuff. And these things were staying in my collection. So... He didn't want me wasting money on stuff that I wasn't going to like or be able to use. Right. So whenever he got new stuff in, he would send me home with the demos so that I could listen to them before I decided to buy them. Nice. This was the type of guy this this is the type of guy that this person was. He was phenomenal and I I really he he's one of the things that I remember and I think about when I want to remind myself that there were good eggs. He was yeah. one of them. In a big way, he was one of them. But like most good eggs, he eventually got really, really, really scrambled. Mm. And he got scrambled by the attitudes of other Christians that walked through the door of that store. Over the course of time, it just got to him. Yeah. And I can remember going in there. This was actually after I was in college. Mm. And we just so happened to be on that street. And I said, it's been a long time since I've seen this person and the store was open. And on the off chance that he's in, I'd like to stop in and say hi. And were, were you with me yeah. for this? I'm pretty sure I was. So do you remember how we walked in and things were like looking like they were being packed up? Yeah. Yeah. And I asked him what was going on. And that was precisely what was going on. He was not selling the store. He was closing the store, liquidating inventory and sending back anything that he could to his distributors. He didn't even want to sell this place when he was done with it. Yeah, he didn't he just... want it to remain in that location because of things that had happened while it was there and the way that certain Christians had treated him when he was running that store with the kindest and gentlest of hearts of anyone that you would ever want to come across in your life. This person was kind and he was gentle and he quote unquote loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He wanted to see the gospel preached and he wanted to see it preached to young people. And he was very enthusiastic about what I was doing because that's what I was doing. I was bringing the gospel to young people. 
Mm-hmm. And he was very into that aspect of it and the involvement part of it. And he would have given me all my music for free if he could have, um, if he could have swung it. Instead, he just gave me extra coupons. So now I was paying about half right. of what I normally would and getting some decent music that I got to keep, you know? Mm-hmm. And I can remember the conversation that I had with him as he's getting his store closed. And I asked him what the real problem was. And he started recounting story after story of people who had walked through that door and treated him like shit. Mm. And the saddest part of that conversation, there were two, two things that really stood out. Number one was how he came to the decision, what the straw was that broke the proverbial camel's back Mm. in this situation was that someone who he had known for years severed their relationship with him. They were friends for a long time, severed the relationship with him over a dispute over $3. Yeah. $3. This is the depth of love that this religion teaches. Mm -hmm. $3. Okay. That was the first thing. And the other thing that is stuck in my head from then until now was how he was contrasting what it was like dealing with delivery people and property managers and all of the people who were outside of the Christian strata. Mm -hmm. Because you don't need to be a Christian to deliver Christian music. Okay. He was dealing with just your average FedEx UPS employees. The mailman would come in. Um, The local beat cop might come in once in a while. The thing that he said to me that really had an impact on me, it was kind of the same thing as that cashier at James way where he said, Joe, I believe in you. I believe in what you are doing with your life. And I think that it's wonderful that you want to serve the Lord in this capacity for me. I just find it easier to deal with the heathen. Mm -hmm. It's really sad. He left that business and went to drive an ambulat. Yeah. Driving old people to their appointments and things like that. That was what he wound up doing with the years that he should have been retired, but he wasn't able to retire because he was plugging away with this store where he was barely getting by and didn't really seem to care because he was doing something good for the community and doing something good for his fellow Christians and spent years being shit on yeah, by his fellow Christians and just looking forward to those moments when the mailman would show up, when the delivery person would show up mm-hmm. because those were those, those were the moments and instances of normalcy yeah, and not being talked down to in a rude or condescending way or being taken advantage of because here's one of the real dangers in the doctrine of forgiveness in Christianity. The very notion that you can take all of your own defects of character and place them on someone else exonerates you of responsibility, right? Christianity teaches nothing about responsibility. And that's a problem because It's that kind of mindset that motivates someone to sever a decades long relationship with somebody over a matter of $3. Yeah. It's sad, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And these are principles and concepts and ways of thinking and personalities that are being developed through this religion right now, all over the world. And this skewed notion of what love is, is permeating more families, more relationships, more churches, more people and their perceptions of the world and their perceptions of themselves every single minute of every single day. That's why we're here. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're doing what we do. And that's why I have such a passion for what I do with this podcast because someone has to be that proverbial voice crying in the wilderness. This is all bullshit. (laughs) 
And I know I'm far from the only one. But I hope that <clears throat> I, I know that there are people out there that are able to hear this message better because of the way that I deliver it and the way that you deliver it. Right. I've been told this. And that's why I'm doing it. And that's why I do it the way that I do it. And that's why I pull no punches. I'm going to tell it to you straight. Your God is a fake and your God is a fraud. And he does not, he does not deserve your loyalty or your worship because you have a much, much better handle on concepts like right and wrong than he will ever have. Stop looking to the Bible for your examples of what love is. You will not find a good example of love anywhere in scripture. I had thought about taking this episode in a, in a slightly different direction and relating my comments back to 1 Corinthians 13, which is what most evangelicals will um, refer to as the love chapter. You cannot undo a thousand plus pages and multiplied thousands and thousands and thousands of words with contrary messaging with just a few verses of sanity in one book. And I do believe that there's a lot of good that is said in that particular chapter about what love is. The problem is it's all talk yeah. because you never ever see any of these things put into practice any place else in scripture. You don't see your God practicing them. You don't see other people practicing them. The closest that you see to anything that falls into the camp of love is what some of the apostles went through for their insistence on preaching the gospel message. There had to be a motivation beyond self to be able to go through what some of these people allegedly went through. There had to be motivations beyond self. There had to be love in there somewhere. There had to be compassion in there somewhere for them to go through the torturings, the martyring, um, that happened the ways that some of these people met their end. There had to be love involved in that, but they were just individuals who got it right. And there were plenty more and there are plenty more in scripture who get it very, very, very wrong. Starting with your daddy, mm -hmm. starting with Yahweh, your God does not know what love is. And it is very, very very clearly evidenced in the way that he deals with humanity throughout the old Testament. And don't sit there and say, well, that's the old Testament. I have um, Malachi four telling me that God doesn't change. And I have Jesus telling me that he didn't come to abolish the law, but that through him, the law would be fulfilled. So lay aside any notion that the old Testament is irrelevant. It counts. And that is the God that is behind this religion of love that you embrace. It's time for you to start loosening that embrace, seeing this God for what he really is, educating yourself about what love is and realizing that you understand it way better than he does. And it'll be one more step that you'll be taking toward getting and staying unbound. hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.